Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Brendan Cole. The Church of England has reopened the discussion of one of the most divisive issues in Anglicanism today by saying that openly gay men could become bishops. However, they may be in civil partnerships, but they have to be celibate. The issue of gay bishops has split the church since 2003, since Geoffrey John was forced to withdraw his candidacy for the bishopric of Reading, following an outcry by conservative evangelicals. The decision last week could pave the way for Dr John, who's now Dean of St Albans, and one of the few openly gay but celibate clerics to finally take up a senior position within the church. In 2005, the church said that someone in a same-sex civil partnership could become a priest as long as they were celibate. Well, what are the issues surrounding this decision last week to discuss this? With me is Reverend Peter Old, Church of England priest and prominent blogger, Alison Ruoff, who's a lay member of the General Synod of the Church of England. John Blowers is also in the studio with me. He's a spokesman for the Evangelical Fellowship for Lesbian and Gay Christians. And on the line, we have Savvy Hensman, who's vice chair uh, at the Lesbian and Gay Christian Movement. Thank you very much uh, for joining me. A warm welcome to you here on The Voice of Russia. Um, first of all, the news last week, uh, Peter Old. What did you make of it? Well, in some senses, it is no news at all. All that has happened is that before Christmas, the House of Bishops lifted a moratorium on considering a person in a civil partnership to be a bishop while it was undergoing a working party looking at that very question. So all that's happened really is that we have gone back to where we were two years ago, nothing's changed, and yet the mainstream media have taken this and blown it out into uh, out of all proportion. John Blowers, nothing has changed. What do you think? I'm not aware of the sort of machinations of the Church of England in that respect. My concern is whenever a person is being considered for any appointment, even a secular appointment, the things that matter are their qualifications, experience, and suitability for the appointment. I'm terribly upset when people's sexual orientation or gender is consideration in making an appointment for that person. Savvy Hensman, the media obviously made a big deal of it last week, but as Peter Old was saying, it's nothing new. I think it's vile to lesbian gay by direction in that it signals that the Church of England is not actively hostile to lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people. Of course, the majority of people, whether they're heterosexual or lesbian or gay, aren't called to celibacy. So there's a relatively small number of people whom this may apply to. But it's a modest move forward. I would like to see the Church of England move far further and acknowledge that loving and committed relationships can be uh, positive for spiritual as well as emotional growth. So uh, moving forward towards affirming relationships, whether or not the partners are celibate, but that is a further step and that would require a change in church policy. Uh, the existing move is well within current church policy. Alison Ruoff, is it uh, a moderate step forward? Frankly, I think it's a nightmare. The very idea of bishops being in a homosexual relationship and who's to say whether they're celibate or not? Yes, they can say they are, but who's to know, I think is what I'm trying to say. It's bad from that point of view, but it's also bad, I think, for the Church of England, which is still... The doctrine of the Church of England is governed wholly by the Bible, the prayer book and the 39 articles. And we cannot get away from that. And this is a major step. I mean, I had no idea the House of Bishops were going to come up with this in December. And as I get older and probably a little bit more cynical and having been on General Synod for many years... It seems to me that this is Rowan Williams' last throw of the dice, pardon the expression as a Christian, to make sure that the way is open for Geoffrey John to become a bishop. And I frankly think the whole thing is outrageous. And further, I would really like to know, did any of the bishops actually vote against this? Uh, Savvy Hensman, what do you make of that? Well, I don't think that it's to do with a, a last throw of the dice. There are two working parties of bishops which have been looking at human sexuality, <coughs> one looking particularly at civil partnerships, and another looking at human sexuality more generally. I think what's happened is a product of that process of looking again at human sexuality in a thoughtful way and maybe trying to put into practice the call to love your neighbour as yourself at the heart of the gospel and to treat others as you would like them to treat you. To follow Jesus's way and teaching, of course, there are a lot of differences around uh, views on human sexuality within the Anglican Communion and within the Church of England itself. 
but I think that it's a matter of basic justice and charity. And um, I don't know uh, much about the private lives of bishops in general. They're not under surveillance. So the same point that Alison raised could be raised about all, all bishops. Alison Roof, I mean, the, the idea of, of, of charity and justice and equality is very much, as um, uh, Sevi Hensman was saying, part of uh, the teachings of the Anglican Church, that this, is, this has got to be a positive thing. No, uh, that, this is nothing about justice. Obviously, any person of any orientation is welcomed into the church. And I would pray and hope everybody who comes will become a Christian. But we have to look at the Bible and also about godliness. And for a leader to have, even if he's now celibate, the fact that he was in a presumably a sexual relationship, I think that's what um, would, would, one would uh, suggest from civil partnerships. Therefore, unless that leader is prepared to repent, and secondly, if they've got writings in the public sphere, as Geoffrey John has, for example, and indeed Rowan Williams, uh, he's got lots of writings about the positive side of homosexuality, but he has said, well, I will go over the teachings of the church. So therefore, can't, you can't have it both ways. The, nothing has actually changed in terms of church teaching here, though, has it? Nothing's it's still it's, it's a celibate relationship that's outside of marriage, in effect. Because exactly. Nothing's changed in terms of church teaching. But the real problem that the Church of England is facing at, at the moment is, how does it live out? out its clear orthodox doctrine in the 21st century environment. Back in 2010, when Geoffrey John was nominated to be the bishop in Southwark, the House of Bishops had some legal guidelines drawn up to kind of help the Crown Nominations Committee, the group that decides who the bishop will be, to help them decide whether candidates could or couldn't be uh, appointed as a bishop. And what they said was, it is okay to not just look at someone's current living arrangements, but to look at whether they have been sexually active in the past, to look at whether they are currently in a relationship with somebody that they've been sexually active with, and what their attitude to that sexual activity is. Now, that's the core of the Christian message. It's not just, it's not just love and forgiveness. It is about repentance, about turning yourself round. You know, I used to be identifying as a home homosexual man. I'm now married. I've got kids. These people, like myself, do exist in the church. We are faithful to the teachings. And all the House of Bishops are saying is that people who, who should be the highest spokespeople in the church should not just be faithful to the church's teachings, but they should appear in their lives to want to follow out the church's teachings. I've got good friends who are gay, who are liberal on this on, on this thing. But as they live as parish priests, they stay celibate, not with like a partner who they are celibate with. They just stay single because they think, yes, I can advocate for change, but I shouldn't be living a life contrary to the rules which I want to change. On the, on the question of celibacy, can I just bring in John Blower's, um, I mean, I was reading a comment from the former Canon Chancellor of St. Paul's, uh, Giles Fraser, and he feels very uncomfortable about the sense of repentance. And he's actually saying that, that it would be sexually active gay priests would have a moral responsibility not to tell the truth if asked about uh, their private lives. I mean, what do you make of that? Yeah, I think it's uh, so disappointing that people have to tell lies in order to keep their jobs. They're calling whatever you like to call it. Who is to say who is celibate and who isn't? I can stand here and say I'm celibate. Do you believe me? If you say so, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not for me to say. <laughs> well, yeah, but I, but I can I'm say so. I'm you in the face I can and also, I say, I, I, if you're telling me the truth, that's fine right. and I'm prepared to believe you. I can also sit here <laughs> and say I'm not celibate. Okay. Do you believe me? Well, equally. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. We're discussing Should Gay Men Become Bishops? with Reverend Peter Old, Alison Roof, John Blowers and Savvy Hensman. Okay, so Giles Fraser, he's, he's a very high-profile figure and he, he makes this statement and, and, and it's got a lot of reaction, but that would be damaging for the church if there was this kind of secrecy and a secret community, effectively. Absolutely. But there still is. I mean, but it's happening church, all the time yeah, and people yeah. are simply refusing to tell their bishop what is going on in the bedroom. And, and, the, and you can't make somebody speak. No. Quite I frankly, think, I don't think there's anything to do with the bishop or anybody else. Well, uh, well I that's do. what you say, John. But the Church of England is not a secular organisation, you know. In a secular organisation, of course, you shouldn't be discriminated against to do with your sexual orientation or what you do in the bedroom. But we are talking about the Church of God. It's not a question of people being forced to lie. 
It's people choosing to break the rules that they agreed to. As a priest, as I went through the process of being ordained, I was asked, will you conform your life to the guidelines, to the sexual morals of the church? And I said, yes. Now, what we're talking about is people who break that vow and then lie about it. But we need to take the focus away from the priests on the ground because actually the real issue in the Church of England is not people lying. It's the bishops who agreed that they would ask all their clergy who entered civil partnerships whether they were sexually active or, or they weren't. And they're not asking the questions. Mm. It's not the priest's fault. It's the bishops who should be running for church and asking these. And, well, surely and, and it's is both. Their right. It has I mean, to be I mean, both. If the question's not asked and the person sitting there knows full well they're in a homosexual relationship, then surely, to goodness, they're going to say, you, you, perhaps you ought to know. As simple as that. It's a, a mishmash of nonsense, the way it's going on. And I think the House of Bishops is utterly cowardly in the way that they behave. Servi Hensman, I mean, what's I your think, view? Yes, I, I mean, I think that would be most intrusive. I mean, the, the notion that, for instance, if there are heterosexual bishops, they should be asked that they mm. sleep together before marriage um, and that this should be some matter for pu- that should be in the public domain, uh, as well as uh, uh, pr- prying into the, the private lives of those who are uh, lesbian or gay in sexual orientation would seem to be most unhelpful and why is it, why I, I think, is it unhelpful because i think a, a prurient interest in the sex lives of senior clergy doesn't help to foster an atmosphere of of love and mutual support and it's focusing on the wrong things i would like to see a, a much deeper debate on the, the issue of sexuality i would like there to be a climate in which people felt much more free to be open about their sexuality. Um, I'll just quote from Issues in Human Sexuality, which was a position paper by the House of Bishops in 1991. It has its flaws. Points out that it's only right that there should be an open and welcoming place in the Christian community, both for those homophiles who follow the way of abstinence, giving themselves to friendship for many rather than to intimacy with one, and also for those who are conscientiously convinced that a faithful, sexually active relationship with one other person, aimed at helping both partners to grow in discipleship, is the way of life God wills for them. But in reality, many LGBT people find the Church of England far less welcoming, that it doesn't offer an open and welcoming place. And it's also become a cause of scandal in the wider community. People who have lesbian and gay brothers and sisters, friends, workmates, children or grandchildren are finding the Church of England's um, lack of welcome, uh, at least in public, while many congregations are actually very welcoming and inclusive, off-putting, and it puts them off hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, which I think is highly damaging. Uh, Alison, if this leads to a retreat into secrecy, then the debate that effectively the Anglican Church on both sides of the divide want to have won't be able to have it. Well, I've been on General Synod since 1995, and homosexuality keeps coming up uh, from time to time on a regular but also sort of irregular basis and to be perfectly frank I'm absolutely sick of it because I want to get on with other things but homosexuality active homosexuals it is scandalous in the eyes of God let's be honest about that. that's what the Bible teaches I was looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4 which talks about leaders in the church to set an example for believers in speech in life in love in faith and in purity and Jesus himself it teaches that the any sex outside of marriage heterosexual or homosexual is wrong and that's where I stand and 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 I want to we have to keep the Church of England uh, on course with biblical discipline and and understanding and living out the right way uh, in terms of obedience to God's law I would point out there has been a lot of theological debate and reflection in the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, indeed, it began earlier, and I think the Church of England and wider Anglican Communion have contributed a lot to that, to that thinking. Many now believe that it is not against basic biblical principles, not only to be lesbian or gay, but to live in a faithful and committed relationship on the same basis that heterosexuals do. That is, applying the same standards of love, justice, commitment, faithfulness, and self-giving 
uh, and outward going love, not only for the couple to care for each other, but to care for the wider community, to care for the needy, to care for all the people of the earth, that the same ethical principles should be applied. And that's something that many, many people have come to believe, from the most eminent theological scholars to ordinary people in the pew. Not everyone agrees with that, but large numbers of people in the Church of England now do. And I think it's important to recognise the strength of those arguments for acceptance of same-sex partnerships, whether or not the partners are celibate. Indeed, Peter Old, the criticism of, I suppose, the scriptural basis for this um, antipathy towards uh, homosexual uh, behaviour is up for dispute, isn't it? This is up for discussion. Isn't it? So, Brendan, we could spend hours talking about this. We could go through the individual Greek words. We could look at their meanings in context. I actually did that, that exercise a few years ago to kind of look again at, at, at stuff. I'm pretty convinced that most of the arguments that, that, that are brought up on the biblical text don't actually have any basis when they come from the liberal side. So talking about, for example, cultic prostitution is what these things I refer to textually no basis. Uh, the classic example of the centurion with his beloved servant, right? Is this a gay relationship? Well, given the context of first century Palestine, a Roman soldier, the only way it could be a, con a, a homosexual relationship is if the servant was a slave and a teenage boy in a basically a paedophilic relationship. That's the only grounds that, that a Roman centurion could have a sexual relationship with a man. All these arguments are put forward. When you really get into them, they're not substantial. I would agree with Savvy on one thing, and that is that we do need to have a good open, honest discussion on issues around human sexuality. And what is happening now is that a lot of conservative leaders in the church are starting to stick their, their hands up, like myself, and say, look, we're not straight, we're not heterosexual, we are faithful to the biblical values that we see in Scripture. So you have great people like Vaughan Roberts, who is the mm -hmm. rector of St. Ebbs in, in Oxford, one of the leading conservative evangelicals in this, in this country, essentially came out a few months ago and mm -hmm. said, look, I'm not heterosexual, and yet I, I believe what the Bible says. It doesn't help our case when people break the rules and then demand for that not to be viewed as something bad, as though they're not the ones rocking the boat. That's the safety in numbers exercise, isn't it? We can all, we, because everybody's <coughs> doing it, it's OK. No, it isn't OK. You're right. Yeah. Can I just quickly bring in John Blowers? I suppose the, the point of, of conservative and evangelical strands of, of the faith are that the, the, the Anglican Church shouldn't be fashionable and it, it should stick to its guns and there's no reason why it should move necessarily with, um, with public demand. It's been, it's been around for hundreds of years and um, it, it, needs to, it, yeah. it needs to have this debate and even if it doesn't take everyone with it, even if it only has 70% approval, um, that's reason enough to, 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 to maintain the status quo. So why haven't we still got slaves? Well, I mean, sla <laughs> well, sla slavery was a human well, rights issue. That, that. Sla well, sla slavery was a human yeah. rights issue that yeah. was that was dealt with by you know a, yeah. at a political level. And the Bible approved it. And the MPs at the but days religious institutions of aren't, aren't political institutions, are they? Argued the Bible supported slavery. That's not quite true, is it? Because for the last two thousand years, we have always had Christians saying one human being owning another human being wrong. is wrong. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the kind of slavery that you see in the Old Testament is different to the Western chattel slavery, which we are most familiar with from the USA from the 17th century onwards. Often it was people putting, the, uh, basically integrating themselves into families. Yeah. Paul wasn't there. Okay, okay, Peter, we're going to have to get back to the topic away from slavery. Um, uh, Sevi Hensman, can I, Sevi Hensman, can I ask you the question? I mean, the, the traditionalists, it's wrong to dismiss them. They're part of the church and their needs and their views have to be taken into account. Certainly, they need to be listened to and I think it's important to have true dialogue. This is something that the Anglican communion at uh, conferences has been calling for since uh, the late 1970s, uh, though sadly some provinces um, have leaders who have flatly refused properly and carefully to study the issues. I think, though, it is important to remember, following on from John's point, that there are Christians who truly did believe and say that the Bible condoned slavery. There were Christians in my lifetime, I remember, who uh, did believe that the Bible condoned apartheid mm -hmm. and se segregation in other places. So it's recognizing that people 
people will sometimes read into the Bible the prejudices of their day and then be convinced that God has led them into something that is actually destructive of human potential and goes against God's will. So I think it is important to try to keep an open mind and recognise that diversity of belief is one of the strengths of the Church of England. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Brendan Cole. We're discussing the divisive issue in Anglicanism. Should openly gay men become bishops? With me is Reverend Peter Old, Church of England priest and prominent blogger. Alison Ruoff, who's a lay member of the General Synod of the Church of England. John Blowers, a spokesman for the Evangelical Fellowship for Lesbian and Gay Christians. And on the line, Savvy Hensman, chair of the Lesbian and Christian Movement. I would like to ask your view, Alison Ruoff, about, I mean, how will this um, issue go down amongst the average churchgoer, do you think? Well, the people I've spoken to are absolutely fed up with the House of Bishops and their nonsense. Um, they're fed up with the fact that nobody's standing up for the truth of the gospel and, and, and the Bible. Uh, they're fed up with the way the Church of England appears to, to, the, to the nation, that it's not making a stand on anything. My personal feeling is that you, what you're seeing now is leading to the change of the, in the Church of England forever. And we are going more and more down the road towards the Episcopal Church in the United States. And you will have a breakaway of biblical, solid biblical believing Anglicans, um, particularly conservative evangelicals, but not, or not necessarily all of them. They will not put up with this. And I will, for one, would say, do not put up with it. If we have to have a bishop from, we have a, from, to come and take uh, for confirmation, for example, I would say go and choose a bishop who's retired, who's a good biblical solid man, or bring in some bishops from overseas. And that's what will happen. So you're looking towards the split in every way of the Church of England, which is absolutely desperate. Peter, oh, that could be, have quite significant consequences, bringing in bishops from overseas if, if, if um, people refuse to be served by uh, a gay bishop in, in England. It could do, but I don't think we are there yet. If I can use Alison's words herself, I don't think I'm quite as old and cynical. I'm sort of young and, and optimistic. <laughs> well, I, don't think that we're, I don't think that we're there yet. I mean, certainly when you look at places like Uganda, Nigeria, Kenya, they are not happy about this. I mean, what you have to remember, for, for example, about the church in Uganda is that the first Christian martyrs in Uganda were a bunch of teenage boys who were killed because they wouldn't have sex with the king. So this issue goes right to the core of their understanding of what it means to be faithful to God. Now, yes, there are sometimes issues in dialogue. So, so, so often, uh, often people in 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 Uganda and Nigeria say things which are which which sound good for their context. And 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 over here we go. Well, I'm not sure that I, I would have phrased it like that. It's very important that we listen to. The, the majority of the worldwide Anglicans who are African, That's under right. 30, female, and, and, and believe but, but in the Bible, it, we are the minority here. And, and, and the liberals, the ones who, who want to change it, are the minority of the minority. Savvy Hensman, isn't the difficulty, to... Savvy, can I, isn't the difficulty that you have, uh, ang there's such a different Anglican communion between Lagos and Los Angeles, for instance. It, it's very difficult to get any kind of agreement across such a broad spectrum. What? most extreme church leaders say in some parts of the world, and it's not just a matter of not phrasing it in the way we would hear. Some of it is overtly homophobic and very unpleasant, and some of it involves positively inciting human rights abuses, which goes against Anglican teaching. I think though that that doesn't necessarily reflect the views of everybody in those churches uh, and very often in entering into dialogue, not, not only with those who are LGBT themselves, and of course there are people across the world who are, but with those who are more willing to listen uh, as well as share their views, much more progress can be made. And I think it is very important to keep talking about the issues, to keep moving beyond those who are just indignant and say, we won't even address this uh, even, um, but uh, Sebi, can I just listen to one another you? and work on, the, work on the theology. Try to do that study in order to determine where God is calling the wider Anglican communion because there are deep differences on this issue within member churches as well as across the world. If I can, if I can interrupt you, all the time I've been on General Synod, I am being exhorted to listen. The listening process, all the time, L liberals in the Church of England say, you must listen. 
But they never, ever, ever listen to the other side, to my side. I mean, I mean, and we've I had I loads and loads of studies done on this and, uh, and it goes on and on and on. But nobody will listen to the biblical side. It's a case of it's got to be right in the eyes of the world and therefore it is right. Uh, ipso facto, no, it isn't because we are getting away from Bible teaching. And that's, we'll never, ever come together unless we can get around the Bible. But people on, on may I say, say it in the kindest way on your side will not listen um, i was brought up at a time when the general opinion was that it, the only right way to be was heterosexual i think many many of us have heard a lot sometimes very aggressively are uh, directed towards us i would be very surprised if there were many lgbt people of my generation middle-aged now or even um, younger in the church who had not heard um, sometimes very hostile remarks directed towards us around sexuality, as well as those are making so-called traditional case, which doesn't necessarily reflect the whole of tradition. Um, yes, I have listened and thought about it, as have many, many people, and we have come to a different conclusion. I, I think, for instance, that that caricature of our views, that it's simply about going along with the world, I would never say that. Um, I, there are many people who would not argue that just because society says something it's right because society was hostile to lgbt people 60 years ago attitudes have changed it's about listening and trying to, to hear where the holy spirit is leading the church and that is uh, a difficult area peter quickly your, your reaction to that i think what's really interesting is we're having this conversation talking about uganda and nigeria and the usa and listening it provokes in me two questions firstly what happens once you've listened? What happens then if you then say, okay, I've listened, but, but we make this choice and this is what we believe? Mm. And the second issue, I, I, I think, is who makes that choice? What happens if the Church of England says, well, we're going to go down a liberal path, but the rest of the Ang Anglican communion says, well, we're not going to? Does the Church of England then come under, say, well, actually, we will now have changed because the, the rest of the Anglican communion is, is actually staying conservative? How do these interrelationships work? John Blowers, I mean, do you, do you think this has the potential to turn more people off the Anglican Church? I have been a victim of a church that was anti-gay. I was a Salvation Army captain. I was found out and thrown out. If tears, repentance and prayers could change me, I would not be here. The Gospel speaks of love, acceptance Jesus spoke and asked us to love one another as he has loved us. And that's where I stand. I'm so glad that I have found an Anglican church where my partner and I are accepted as any other couple, regardless of whether we claim to be celibate or not. We are both on the PCC and we just enjoy our worship together and we would have loved and our vicar would have loved for us to have a civil partnership, marriage, within the church, and he would have loved to have done it for us. And I think he's not alone. I'd just like to finish by thanking my guests, Alison Roof, lay member of the General Synod of the Church of England and representative to the London Diocese, mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Peter Old, a Church of England priest and prominent blogger, John Blowers, spokesman for the Evangelical Fellowship for Lesbian and Gay Christians, and on the line, Savvy Hensman, commentator on politics and religion and also uh, vice chair at the Lesbian and Christian Movement. Thank you so much for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia in London. <laughs>